Good evening, this is Pastor Doug with Hempfield Church of the Brethren. I welcome you tonight in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, as we start a series, a four-week series on marriage. I want to open the conversation. That's, that's one of my goals in doing this. Um, and I'm curious, as you sign on, um, if you can say hello. Um, let's... Uh, as you sign on, as you say, uh, say hello. If you have any questions around scripture and marriage, um, whatever they may be, please ask them in the comments. If for some reason you do not feel comfortable in doing that, send us a message, shoot me an email. Um, this is something that's been on my heart for... I mean, specifically two years, but I mean, probably closer to 25. I've been looking into marriage and scripture and seeking God's way, seeking God's redemption, seeking God's uh, plan in and through all of this. Um, if for some reason I do not respond to your comment, um, don't take that personally. Sometimes I see them, sometimes I do not. But this is a conversation that has become contentious. It's divided families, it's divided churches. Um, it's made it hard to even have the conversation. And I want us to seek together, to dig together, to ask together, Ask together and see where God may lead in all of this. Hello, Gingrix. Um, so a couple questions I have. If God carries a design for marriage, would we want to know? Uh, and if we act outside of that design, would we want to know? What is revealed in marriage? What does this mean for a single person? John 1.14 says that Jesus came full of truth and grace. Hello, Dad. And when I hear the conversations that happen sometimes, even among brothers and sisters in Christ, there is either a lacking in truth or there's a lacking in grace. And I'm hoping that we can hold those two in tension. So my prayer in the next four weeks is that we can depend on Christ, that we can seek, ask, and dig together, that we may change the tone of the conversation that I've I've heard, and we can model we can model and listen to Christ, and we can love as Jesus loves. Carolyn says, "What was God's original plan for marriage?" I'm hoping that we can touch on that tonight, um, because I. Th I think in order to understand that, we need to go back to the beginning. Um, and over the next four weeks, we're going to dig together. I'm sure more questions are going to come up. I, I want us to think and pray all the way through this and figure out how we can love one another as Christ has loved us. Um, so what I'd like to do first is open with a word of prayer. We're going to start in the, the Gospel of Matthew and then uh, work our way around. So let's have a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for your spirit here. I thank you for the scripture that has been passed down to us, that we can continue to dig together, that we can continue to seek you together, and that we can humble ourselves and ask the questions, that we can go to you for the answers. Some of these answers are clear, some of them are less clear, but we know that you will lead, guide, and direct us. So I pray, Father, that you watch over us in this time, and I lift this all to you in Christ's name. Amen. So, we'll start in Matthew 19. And in Matthew 19, uh, Jesus has been teaching, and some Pharisees come to him. Uh, it says he's in the, the, the region of Judea, uh, beyond the Jordan. And says, some Pharisees, this is in uh, Matthew 19, verse 3. 
And this is the exciting thing about our faith. If you do not have a Bible, please let the church know. We can send one to you. But you can test what I say tonight. And I want you to test what I say tonight. I want you to dig into Scripture yourself. I want you to pray and seek God. I want you to ask for His help that the Spirit may lead God and direct us. Because we may come from many paths, but when we follow the one shepherd, He will lead us together and we will hear His voice through one another, through His Word, um, through prayer. We will hear His voice. So in, in Matthew 19, verses 3 and following... It says, some Pharisees came to Jesus. Pharisees were the, the religious elite of the time. They came to Jesus testing him and asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? They wanted to know what the law said. They knew what the law said. They wanted to test Jesus to see how he would respond. And he answered them, Jesus answered them, and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. The Pharisee said to him, why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? They want to know why Moses went against God, if, if indeed uh, this was what was set from the beginning. And Jesus responded, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it has not been this way. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. So Jesus takes the bar and he raises it, which he often does. He does this with anger. He does this with prayer. He does this with, uh, with um, lo even love, loving our enemies. So instead of getting into their conversation and justifying their actions he points them back to the beginning and it's interesting because this thought's been on my mind for some time and I was reading a book by Esau Macaulay uh, named Reading While Black and he points to this also in a different context but Jesus points them back to the beginning so that's where we're going to go tonight we're going to go to Genesis 1 and 2 and we're going to bounce around a little bit In Genesis 1, Genesis means beginnings. It's at the beginning of the Bible. It's the very first book. And in Genesis 1, it kind of it kind of lays the, the groundwork for this is how creation was made. And before we get into Genesis 1 and 2, there's one thing I, I want us to understand. Because there are some who will say if you have a little reading of the Bible, you'll have to throw it out in the first two chapters because of the names of God alone. What I believe that mindset's coming from is a 21st century or even a 20th century uh, North American mind. There's a better way to read scripture. And I learned this at Millersville when I was at Millersville. I had a professor, and I believe her name was Rosenthal, Instead of reading it from our perspective, what, what she wanted us to do was to dig into the history, dig into the context, understand why the author wrote what the author wrote so that we not, did not miss the intended point. And that's what we want to do when we dig into Scripture. We want to understand what the author intended. So, you go into Genesis 1 and it, it, it starts, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so he creates everything in their time. And in 126, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man. So, in, in 126, it says, let us make man in our image. 
some Christians have read the, the, the Trinity into that. I don't know if that was the intent. The I understand that perspective, but from my understanding, it was it was God speaking to his heavenly court. You see this language in Isaiah 6. Who will go for us and whom shall I send? Um, it's, it's a very uh, popular verse. It's, it's God speaking to his heavenly court. So he's, he says, let us make man in our image. And I can't remember where exactly where it is, but in Hebrews, it says about entertaining strangers, for some have uh, entertained angels and not known. And it's just interesting to me. It's just interesting to me. I don't want to get off. I don't want to get off track here. So in verse 27, it says, God created man in his own image. And in the image of God, he created them, him, male and female, he created them. So both male and female were made in the image of God. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. And to every beast on the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. God saw all that he made, and behold, it was very good. Now what's interesting there, if, if, you, if you take your time and you read it slow enough, you realize there is no death. There is no death in Genesis 1. Man eats plants, animals eat plants, there's no death. And another side note, man rules over the fish, the animals on land, the animals in the sky. He does not rule over one another. It does not say that they are to rule over one another. They rule over the animals and the plants. So in Genesis 1... We see that man and woman are both made in the image of God. That means every single person made bears an image of the Creator. And if you go to Genesis 5, when Seth is born, it says that Seth was made in the image of Adam. Well, Adam is made in the image of God. So that image has been passed down generation to generation to generation. So Jesus said, Have you not read from the beginning? Then we go to Genesis 2. And in Genesis 2, 18 and following, it says, Then the Lord God... So this, is, this, is, this has been a stumbling block for some people because the, it goes from God, in the beginning God created, now in Genesis 2 it's the Lord God. And I believe that's to show relationship. He is the Lord. We create nothing he has created everything. He is the one who's in control. He is the one who's in charge. He is the Lord God. So he forms man. He, he has him name all the animals. Um, he places him in the garden. Let's, let's look at chapter 2, 18 and following. It says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a suitable helper. So this kind of expands Genesis 1. It may break down how things went. Where Genesis 1 paints the broad picture, this kind of begins to look at the trees. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. I mean, the cool thing about that is we... God's created everything. We're made in the image of God. God is creative, and he's, he's now bringing the man, the animals, and he says, you name them. He's allowing us to participate in that creativity. And what's awesome is that still happens today. Scientists are still naming animals today. How awesome is that? We are still participating in creation. The man gave name to all the cattle and to all the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. And when we look at this word helper, this is like God's ally without which the man could not fulfill his purpose. This isn't like a secondary. This is 
We're going to get to that. So the Lord, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. So before we go any further, he pulls, he pulls from his side. The woman is created from the man's side. They stand on level ground. They stand together. They're side by side. He fashions a woman from the man's side. I can't stress this enough. The Lord God, who stands above, fashions a woman from the man's side. They stand on level ground. They stand beside one another. The man said, Now this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken, from, she was taken out of man. And there's a there's a play on words. It's just like the 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 English man and woman. I believe it's Yesh and Yesha. Um, she's called woman. And then you have this this interesting verse here. And this is what Jesus quotes: For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Who were Adam and Eve's father and mother? Who was Adam's father and mother? It was God who created him. Why would that verse need to be in there? Have you ever asked that question? I think sometimes we read things so often, we just make assumptions. Why would that need to be in there? For this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and the two will become one flesh. Which is interesting because they were made from one flesh. They were she was taken from his his side. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And we'll touch on that. We'll, we'll probably touch on that next week. Which is another interesting piece of commentary. So the man and woman, you know, we learn in, in chapter 3 that they, they work the garden together. And it's like I said, there was, there was no death. They were to, to be fruitful and multiply. And one of the things I used to tell the youth is that when man and woman come together, when man and woman have sex, one of the first things that God did was bring forth life. So when man and woman have sex, when man and woman come together, one of the first things that may happen is you may bring forth life. And when you're talking to your children about this, when you're talking to teens especially, keeping that in mind uh, is a sober assessment. We are made in the image of God, and when man and woman come together, life may come forth. Sometimes we see that in marriages where uh, the youngest may be a gift, we'll say, or a surprise. And they were to be fruitful and multiply. There was no death. They were to live, it seems, eternally together to tend what God had given them to have a family, to be fruitful and multiply, to spread over the earth. There was no death. There was no sin at that point. The two of them together reflected the image of God. Both of them individually reflected the image of God. So when the Pharisees come to Jesus and they say, Is this permissible? He tells, he asks the teachers of the law. And I mean, just so we're on the same page, in that time, to get to that point, you had to memorize, you had to memorize the entire Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament. And it's laid out in such a way that there are markers to help that, to recall it to mind. So 
these guys knew the scripture. And Jesus is saying, have you not read the first two chapters? Have you not read the beginning? That in the beginning he made them male and female, and for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and the two will become one? There was no lordship between man and woman at that time. They stood on level ground before the Lord God. And what's interesting is you see some of this reflected back, back in Ephesians with Paul. And this is one of those verses, this is one of those passages that has been abused by the church. Um, if you have grown up in a tradition that has abused this passage, I apologize. Um, if you've been hurt because of this, please call me and we can connect you with someone who might be better equipped. Call me and let me know. Just share your story. Um, but back in Ephesians 5, all of Ephesians points to Christ. And in 521 it says, And be subject to one another in the fear of Christ, or the reverence of Christ. Be subject. Submit to one another in the reverence of Christ. And then there's a part for wives, and then there's a part for husbands. We need to read our own part. We don't need to point to the part not addressed to us with our spouse and say, this is what you're supposed to do. No, no, no. We need to read our own part. So Paul says, wives, be subject or submit to your own husbands, which is important, your own husbands, as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is also the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be subject to their husbands in everything. And we can dig deeper into this verse later. But the wives are supposed to submit to their husbands as the church submits to Christ. Paul goes on to say, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands are supposed to love their wives as Christ loved the church so that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word that he might present to himself the church in all her glory having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing and that she would be holy and blameless so husbands also ought to love their own wives their own wives as their own bodies he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes, cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. We are members of Christ's body. Husbands, we are to love our wives as Christ loved the church. If you are unfamiliar with how Christ loved the church, I would, I would encourage you to dig into 1 Corinthians 13, and Philippians 2, there are two good starting places. Christ humbled himself. He became obedient to death. He became a servant. Again, this is not for one spouse to hold, hold this over another spouse. We are to grow mutually together. The Adam and Eve were set to live a lifetime, to explore God's creation, and to, to grow with one another together. A lifetime. What can you learn about someone from someone in a lifetime? How can you bless them? How can you serve them? How can you love them? So Jesus points back to Genesis 1 and 2 and says, Have you not read from the beginning? When we dig into marriage, when we dig into the purpose of marriage and the design of marriage, there's something much deeper there. If we're made in the image of God, there is an eternal image there set right here in the temporal. That's beautiful. 
So this is our starting point. Man and woman are made in the image of God. They came together to co-create and tend the creation that God set them in. They were told to be fruitful and multiply. Um, and it's interesting because in Genesis 2 it lays out all these lands and all these streams almost like a road excuse me, a road map for them to, this is where you will go and be fruitful and multiply. This is where, you, this is what you will subdue. And this is what Christ pointed to. It's this side by side, serving under the Lord our God to tend what he has placed us in. And we have an, a lifetime to learn about one another, to love one another, to explore God's creation, and to go to Him. We'll look at Genesis 3 next week. We'll touch on Genesis 3. You know, God walked among them in the cool of the day. He, he, he engaged with them, and we can still engage with God today. So as we go into the upcoming weeks, this is our baseline. Marriage is a, a commitment to serve one another, to love one another, to submit to one another. All with the foundation of love. And with the church, that foundation is Christ. So... Next week, we'll continue the conversation. Um, if you have questions, if you have observations, please call me. Um, and we can talk, because I want us to explore this together. I thank you for this time, and I pray that this allows us to draw closer to God and closer to one another, and also begin to shift the tone of this conversation. I will see you next week. And uh, we'll keep it going. May you be blessed and may you be a blessing. It's your brother in Christ.